kind of in an unusual way, God really is moving in us and drawing us deeper. And it had to be back sometime in the 80s uh, because granddad died in 1990. So sometime in the 80s, I felt this stirring. And so I took a tent and I went up and camped out a night or two at the small lake at my grandparents' farm and just was seeking God. So early one of those mornings, I went out, and um, you know how you just sort of breathe a prayer to the Lord? And I, would, I was really sensing God's nearness, so I just said something like, because I was getting ready to go fishing there and throw my line out, and I said, Lord, it would be great to catch a three-pounder. Now, for you fishermen, that seems like nothing. But I had never caught a fish bigger than a pound and probably not even a pound my entire life up to this point. So I just breathed that prayer. I thought three pounds sounded really big and it'd be great to catch a three pounder. So I throw my line out into the water and begin to reel it in and bang. I get a fish, feel it tugging, pull it in, take it to the nearby scales and weigh it. What do you suppose it weighed? Three pounds. Penny, I'm thrilled. I mean, I, I, you know, I just had goosebumps. I was amazed. I was thrilled. And then I'm thinking, why didn't I ask for a 10-pound fish? <laughs> well, prayer is something that I have wrestled with a long time. I continue to wrestle with it. But I have lots of questions about, about how prayer works. One of the questions I have is, does prayer actually change circumstances? What do you think about that? Does prayer change circumstances, situations? Well, certainly with Hezekiah and Isaiah, Isaiah went to King Hezekiah and announced to him, get your house in order because you're dying. And Hezekiah, Isaiah's leaving, Hezekiah cries out to the Lord. And then the Lord speaks to Isaiah, turn around and go back and tell Hezekiah, I've extended his life 15 years. Well, my question in that is, would God have extended Hezekiah's life had Hezekiah not prayed? Hmm. So does prayer actually change situations and circumstances? What about this one? This is I wrestle with. Does prayer actually change God? I know part of us sort of bristles with that changing God. I thought God, the Bible says in Malachi, God changes not. And yet, in the narratives, we find God and Abraham sort of bartering about Sodom and Gomorrah. Remember, it goes from Abraham said, if there are 50 righteous, uh, and God says, okay, if there's 50 righteous, I won't destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. And Abraham begins bargaining, gets God all the way down to 10 people, and God says, okay, if there are 10 people there who are righteous, I won't destroy it. Now, we know that there weren't even 10, but nonetheless, the fact that God kept altering the, the numbers that he had given to Abraham or the edict that he had given to Abraham. And then the one in, in, in Exodus 32, where God is going to just, just slay the whole nation and start over with Moses, and Moses cries out in intercession, and the Bible says in Exodus chapter 32, I think it's about verse 14 or so, uh, that God changed his mind. The literal rendering is, and God repented. Have you ever thought about that? Does God, does prayer change God? And then I wonder, does prayer change us? Think so? Does prayer change us? And if so, how's that work? Does prayer change our attitudes? Does it maybe change our perspective? Does it change our heart about something? And if prayer changes us, then what happens if we don't pray? Does that mean that we're not changed? So I'm wrestling with all these things about prayer, and part of it is that I think that, that prayer sort of defined uh, a chief characteristic of Jesus. If, if you want to describe what captured the interests of the disciples, they never requested that Jesus teach them to heal. They never said, teach us to teach or preach, but they did request, teach us to pray. Have you ever wondered what Jesus' prayer life looked like? When he would go off to the mountain to pray, what do you envision that looking like? I mean, was he just reciting some prayers by rote? 
Do you, do you envision him being fervent in prayer, intense maybe, really focused? How do you think about Jesus praying? Well, whatever it was, the disciples were moved enough by it to request, Lord, teach us to pray. Now, one of the things that may have precipitated that request happened several days before the request at a place called the Mount of Transfiguration. Jesus took three disciples, Peter, James, and John, up, atop, up to the top of this mountain. He leaves the rest of the disciples down below. And there, Jesus is transfigured before them. That means that the glory that was in him began to shine outwardly so that his garments were as white as snow and bright and vivid. And, of course, the disciples, were, they were afraid. And, um, and then appearing in that was Elijah and Moses, and they're visiting with Jesus. The whole thing is really connected to Moses going up to Mount Sinai, and Jesus is the fulfillment of the law and the prophets, so you have Moses representing the law, you have Elijah representing the prophets. So there on the Mount of Transfiguration, you have Jesus connecting the old and the new, and they're visiting, and the Bible says that Peter was terrified, and so he says, Lord, let me build three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Why is it? that when we really don't have anything to say, we say it anyway. You ever done that? I've told all three of my kids, all three of them pretty much have rejected the counsel, but I've told them many times, silence is always an option. It's okay to just say nothing. But Peter could not just say nothing. And so out of terror, he said, let me build these three tabernacles. And the Bible says, while he's still talking, God comes in a glory cloud and interrupts Peter, basically. And, and the glory of God just shines all around, and the voice of the Lord says, this is my beloved son, in whom I'm well pleased. Listen to him. Here's the part, to me, that's really interesting. A couple of things. One... When Peter wants to capture the moment with the tabernacles, that's so human. That's so like what we do. If you've ever been to a really awesome conference, Christian conference, or the, our kids go to summer games, or maybe you've been to a really neat retreat, and the Spirit of God was just so powerful, and don't you just want to stay there? You just want to live on that mountain, and it's sort of human to want to just stay in that kind of an intense atmosphere. But... Jesus doesn't let us stay on the mountain. We have to come back down into the rotten here and now, back down into the valley to live this out in the daily grind. So he brings them back down the mountain, has some conversation with them as he's doing it. And then he gets to the base of the mountain and there's a crowd that's gathered and there are people arguing. Already they're just thrown right back into daily life. And after some dialoguing, talking, we find out what happens. Uh, there's a demon-possessed boy that the remaining disciples who had been left could not exercise. Evidently, they'd been part of that where Jesus had sent some out, given them power and authority over demons, but they couldn't cast out the demon. And the father was upset, and the crowd's upset, and they, these disciples couldn't do it, and Jesus finds out more, and so Jesus delivers the boy and cures him. The demon leaves the child. On the way back to their headquarters, the disciples ask Jesus, why couldn't we drive this demon out of this boy? And Jesus said this, this next slide, he says, this kind can be driven out only by prayer. What's he talking about? Jesus is talking to a group of Jewish people who have spent their entire lives stopping everything they do three times a day and praying various forms of the Shema, Hero Israel, the Lord our God is one, you shall love the Lord with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and you shall teach these things to your children. And the tefillah, which were various blessings of the Lord and benediction songs, and then they would pray private prayers after this three times a day. Doesn't it seem like 
this would be a people of prayer? I mean, we wear green dots. We have green dots. I have a green dot on my phone. Doesn't that make me a man of prayer? Think about these disciples. They, they've lived this way all their lives. Three times a day, wherever they are, they stop and they pray. Or they gather around the temple area if they're there and they pray. And yet Jesus said this kind can be driven out only by prayer. Is he talking about that there are some prayers that are more intense than others? Maybe what they're doing is praying more by rote. And Jesus is talking about a level of prayer, a dimension of prayer, a degree of prayer that is deeper than that, that is needed to really tear out strongholds in people's lives. In fact, in some of the later manuscripts, the words and fasting are added to verse uh, Mark chapter 9, 29. In other words, it, it's rendered this kind can be driven out only by prayer and fasting. And it's possible, it's possible that that was added as a description to the type of prayer Jesus is talking about because fasting involves sacrifice and a greater level of intensity. So in other words, this is not just your routine type of praying. So that's possible. The intensity that Jesus is talking about, this kind can be driven out only by prayer, leads me to think that that we're to explore prayer in a little deeper way, um, levels of prayer, maybe intensities of prayer. And I've, I've chosen three scriptures that sort of give us this flavor. James chapter 5, verse 16, James says, and this is the Lord's, probably the Lord's half-brother, who would then become a pastor of the church at Jerusalem. He said, the effective Earnest energize, in other words, other translations render it this way. The Greek word is pretty pregnant. The effective or earnest or energized, one translation says the fervent prayer of a righteous person can accomplish much. So it's effective or it's earnest or energized or fervent, and it's the prayer of a righteous person, um, someone in right standing with God. In other words, in Christ, we have that right standing. But that prayer is effective. So if there is effective prayer, is there ineffective prayer? But it implies that. Or it certainly implies that this is a deeper level of prayer that has greater impact. And then Paul says in Ephesians 6.18, and pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. Pray in the Spirit. So is there a sense about being in the Spirit? Or is that just kind of a doctrinal thing where I accept that I'm in the Spirit by being in Christ? Or is there an unction, to use a kind of a King James word, an anointing that we flow in that is a sense of being in the Spirit, but even then, all kinds of prayers and requests. So there's not just one. It's not a one-size-fits-all. And then finally, he says in 1 Timothy 2.1, Paul says that petitions, prayers, intercessions and thanksgiving be offered on behalf of all. So um, imagine it, imagine these various kinds of prayer like Ephesians 6 is talking about, 618, pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. Imagine it sort of like a toolkit or a workshop area. And the more proficient we become, the larger the projects we can take on. Now, in my household, I pretty much, if it can't be done with a screwdriver or a drill, um, maybe some duct tape, it really doesn't need to be done. So I'm not very proficient at larger projects. I thought it was pretty cool. I needed some trees trimmed, and I went and found one of those manual long pole pruners. Have you seen those? It has a rope on it. Man, I thought, that's awesome. I got the trees all trimmed up. I was clear up on a ladder. I felt like I was like 20 feet in the air. It's just a little bit more than a step ladder, but I felt like I was really up there. I had that pole extended, and I got it all trimmed up. Now, for other people, they bring their chainsaws, and they just do it in, in, in fraction of the time, but that's where I am. So think of prayer kind of being like that tool bag or tool kit or, office or, or workshop where maybe you're like me and you're sort of at a screwdriver and drill and hammer. And if you get a, if you get a bigger project, something that demands more, 
then you have to acquire bigger tools. And then you have to learn how to use them. Well, it seems that Paul is implying that that's kind of like prayer. Depending on the level we go, we have to acquire greater tools in order to do this work. Around the time of my dad's death, his passing, I felt God speak something to me. I'm calling you to be a man of prayer. So several days after that, I was on a prayer walk, and I asked the Lord, what does it mean to be a man of prayer? And almost immediately, I felt these words. So this is, this is almost 20 years ago. This has stayed with me all these years. I wrote it down in my little Bible that I still carry today, still have, use it all the time. And I felt these words. What does it mean to be a man of prayer? It means you stay before me regarding the things I lay on your heart until I pull you through, then you walk out the victory. I had to ponder that. I still ponder that. It means you stay before me. In other words, situations or people that come to mind, I hold them before the Lord because these are the regarding the things he lays on my heart. So it's not just, just any, anything that I want to pray over. It's more... How are you directing me? To whom are you directing me to pray? And then I hold them there. And it may be minutes, it may be hours, it may be off and on for several days or longer, but you hold them there until I pull you through. And then you walk out the victory. Now, it's victory defined by God, not by me. I don't know if that means that the person's going to be healed. It may mean that... Through those prayers, I'm helping them to deal and cope with whatever they have to face. That's in God's hand. But what I have to do is hold them before the Lord. So here's a scripture that has sort of formed me regarding this, and it's in Romans 8, 26 and 27. It says, the Spirit also helps. So take note of that word. I'm going to touch on it. The Spirit also helps our weakness. For we do not know how to pray as we should. But the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings. Take note of the word groanings. Too deep for words. And he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is because he intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. So, one of the things that we can do is I would invite you to take your prayer sheet again. And... This is what I'm talking about. We take a prayer sheet, something like this, and you just begin going through this. But as you do, you're listening inside or you're sensitive inside to what God might be highlighting. And let's say it's our daughter Amy. I just came to our daughter Amy. And there's something about that that strikes you, so you stay there. You don't hurry through this. You stay there. And it says the spirit helps. That word helps is a Greek word that means to take hold or to join with. So the spirit in you is tugging. It's like the trolling line of fishing. You feel the spirit tugging. And so you stop there. And you just hold that situation before the Lord. Don't be in a hurry. Because God's using you to change circumstances or um, bathe the situation in prayer. So you hold it there. And then, maybe within your spirit, there is a, a sigh or a groan. Or maybe you'll even sense um, almost what you could call a syllable being formed. And... In faith, you just, a syllable maybe you don't even understand, but it's about this because you don't know how to pray as you should, but the Spirit prays in you, and so maybe there's a syllable that comes to mind or a couple syllables, and you just pray them out. Or you sigh, you groan, whether it's this deep sigh or these groans or syllables that come, the Spirit is joining with you, and then the Spirit is praying through you with groaning. The point of it is it goes beyond your intellect. 
It's not a prayer that we pray intellectually. It's a prayer that we pray out of the Spirit. And then we trust and rest in faith that God, through those inner sighs and groanings, is praying the will of God. Isn't that what we want? That's what we want. But we have to be patient with that process and not just run through it and do a checklist, but see who the Holy Spirit is naming within us or highlighting for us or drawing us to be lifting up in a special way. So you can see that prayer is sort of like the developing of relationships as we go deeper and deeper and deeper in prayer. For example, you have a new person who comes to church. And the first thing we do is we greet them and connect with them. And sometimes prayer, it's just at that level, and that's a good level. It's just connecting because sometimes we just need to feel valued. And so someone comes in, and they're greeted warmly, and they just sense there's love here, and they just feel that connection. And sometimes that's what prayer does primarily. It just helps us to feel valued, that God cares about us. But then, let's say that person becomes a part of the church and becomes a, an active member of a small group. And it begins to feel safe enough to him or her to begin to divulge some things, maybe some long-term grief she's experiencing, some loss that she's had, and she shares it with the group. And in that environment, they begin to comfort her. The prayer of comfort. And that's a really important thing. And so she feels comforted by the group just giving her words of affirmation and maybe quoting Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, come to me all you who labor and are heavy burdened and I will give you rest. But then let's say that as she's, as she's here a longer time, there are some issues in her life and she seeks formal counsel. And so she goes and then who's ever counseling her begins to probe about some issues and some things are exposed and it's sometimes painful, but she's experiencing empowerment and a new level of freedom. So you see how prayer of connection and comfort and now counsel. But then there are some strongholds, maybe addictions, maybe some dysfunction and codependency issues that have just wreaked destruction in her family system. And finally, she's at a point where she wants to deal with this stuff tear up the roots of this, to really face it head on. And so she deals with that, with, with surrounded by love and compare, care and compassion, and she faces, whether it's an addiction or whether it's an overwhelming circumstance, and those roots of that are torn up. And like the boy who was, was so affected by darkness, freedom comes. So we've gone from connection to comfort to counsel to cure of those deeply entrenched things. Well, those are different levels of prayer. And all of them are good, but they're not all the same. And if our only praying is with a hammer, we sort of establish, well, this is how I like to pray, that's your hammer, then every problem is what? A nail. But what happens when the problems are not just nails? Then we really don't have the proficiency to deal with it. We have to grow in prayer, and that's what Paul is inviting us to do. As the Spirit takes us deeper, we groan, we sigh, we intercede, and we are praying the very will of God. So the invitation today, Jesus invites us to go with him to the mountain of prayer and to go deeper in what it means to be intercessors for the living God. In the same night that Jesus would give himself, he took the bread as the disciples gathered around the table, reclining with him. He took the bread and he blessed it and he broke it and he gave it. And he said, this is my body given for you. Eat this as often as you eat it in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup and he said, this is my blood of the new covenant shed for the sins of the world. Drink this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Shall we pray? Lord, we consecrate these elements, this bread, the body of Christ, this cup, the blood of Christ. Ensure in certain hope in the resurrection of Jesus. Lord, thank you for your grace. Thank you for this table of communion that allows us to examine our hearts, 
that allows us, no matter what condition we're in, to come and receive the grace of God, forgiveness and cleansing. Thank you. We honor you and we praise you. In the name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Amen. The stewards would come, please. Ours is an open communion. That simply means that you're welcome here. Uh, you don't need to be a member of our church. You